thing. All right, we're back up and rolling. All right, Mill probably just, uh, which is fucking. Yeah, but you do a lot of editing, right? Not really. Not really. This yeah, but some of the stuff we're talking about is kind of boring, so you might want to cut the fat. Yeah, that's why I'm saying, well, let's just restart it. Again? Well, I mean, we were just talking bullshit anyway. I know, so we were talking we, about we people get getting the... their penis crumbled into ashes. Yeah, that was good. it was funny, I mean, but... <laughs> <laughs> if you feel like adding that in, fine. If not, I understand. Hi, it's David Hewlett with the Paprika Podcast Show. We're going to try this one more time. We had our stream drop off this a couple times. This is the third time. This the is the third, third time. time we've tried this, you guys. Everybody knows that's the charm, Angie Crum. Angie Crum is a charm, and she's here with us in studio along with Blake Hi. Powell. He's visiting Hello. us from Montana. Uh, big, the the thriving comedy, uh, the beating heart of comedy, uh, Missoula, as we all know, where he has been doing one highly written and uh, prepared open mic a week. Yeah. <laughs> and, and now... That's um, how Vegas was 15 years ago. And, and he's got, <laughs> and he's got to be woke about it, too, right? Are they... Sin- so there's it's, a real liberal scene where you're from in Montana? It's pretty liberal, which, I mean, for the most part is fine, but... Uh, for comedy's sake, it gets a little annoying. Like, when I started, right when, like, the pandemic was ending, before that, it was, like, super... It was pretty much TED Talks on stage, which is, like, that's great. You, that's you have a struggle. That's fucking gross is what yeah. that is. That's so... I mean... But... So, like, the whole time... Because you said you sat there and watched for years before you finally went up. Yeah, when so I So you're sitting there watching this garbage, and you're sitting going... I guarantee I'm going to get up there and I can do better than that. Or you're sitting yeah, there going, how a, do the fuck do these people think this is goddamn comedy? Yeah, there's a few where it's like, holy shit, I'll never be that good. But then 90%, it's like, I can do better than that. Which yeah. is a really shitty thing to say. But Which, two years in, you are ta- more talented than most of the people are two years in. You're more talented than I was. Well, thank you. Yeah, I, you're welcome. Yeah, I, I agree with that. You're right. Your writing is solid and you're performing. You got up and you, you did your jokes at Backstop. I saw you do that. And you're getting laughs and... You have the, the format down, and then it's just a matter of confidence. My favorite thing about when you're the backstop and you sat down, and you're like, oh, man, I didn't realize that I didn't have to be politically correct. Politically yeah, correct I would have changed here. everything. I, <laughs> I've got so much other stuff that's yeah. actually funny that I can say. I'm doing dumb fucking jokes. Like, quality is cool, isn't it? Like, yeah. not here. You don't have to do that shit. Yeah, I, I, that was always my favorite when, like, an L.A. comic would come to one of the open mics and they'd be like so Donald Trump is yellow right and then they stop for like an applause break or something right. it's like they check out that, Facebook too go right what do you yeah, doing yeah there's so many of those comedians where I live where they like push they just joke about how shitty Trump is and it doesn't do good it's like yeah nobody cares about that like just be funny about it you're it's just trying not, to be like it's so. not even low hanging fruit it's not even hack it's 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 just lazy it, it's not even it's not even lazy because anyone who is just trying to get like you know these are uh, the these are people who the whole point of comedy is to say things in a way that you have you know, other people haven't thought of I mean that's the whole yeah. point is to I take hear why Trump is cool like how Shane Gillis did it he had the whole if you, if you guys haven't seen Shane Gillis's Special, check it out. special is fire. But, like, that was the first time I've heard, like, a Trump bit that was actually unique and funny. Because it was like, right. all your dads are fucking Fox News watchers. And yeah. Like, people can't deny that shit. My dad was. Yeah. It's all about Fox News. My family was always Republican and <coughs> Mine until, too. until this most Got recent thing. Republicans. Yeah, and now My dad's from Montana, so, I mean, that's I did a big part of my growing up there. My grandma explained it very simply. She's like, she loved Donald Trump. Like, when it, during all those stuff, she's like, oh, I love him. He's my man. Yeah. He's my man. I love Trump. Her but color was orange. It, it's, um, <laughs> but it's because she, she's a businesswoman. She was an accountant. Like, she developed her own accounting. So my, this is how gangster my, uh, it, or how serious of an entry into, like, accounting and business my grandmother got. When she was at LSU, her second day as like an intern in this this accounting office, the FBI comes in and arrests everybody except for her and one other intern. Wow. And then she learned how to be an accountant. My grandfather and her started a business, Chris Mortgage, if you're an old timer in New Orleans, you know that business. And it, 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 when it came down to it, she's like, look, Republicans fuck with your money less than Democrats do, period. That's 100% my political stance. That's what she said, uh, and, and just, that's why I got out of it. And, uh, and, you know, as a, an adult now, I'm like, oh, I, that makes sense. Like, I get it. Especially since I've – I ended up with a degree in journalism and philosophy. So I just say I have a degree in propaganda. And when we started seeing this crazy wave of news stuff 
from this dead industry, which is the mainstream media. It was dead ten years ago, or twenty years ago, when it, it, when I was when I was an intern in two thousand and six. I got into this TV station. I'm like, this is not a real thing. Like, the, like who's keeping the lights on here? Because yeah. it's not the it's not the viewers. Where was that at? Uh, that was in Birmingham. Oh, okay. Yeah, in Birmingham, Alabama, is where I graduated from UAB, and uh, not like really a great like journalism school. I just I did the credits, I did the classes, I yeah. passed, I got a degree, mm-hmm. and all that. But I was always about I was always interested in the bigger picture. That's what I liked about reporting. That's what was interesting. It's like you're a cop without a gun. You you should be pissing off politicians. You should be getting death threats if you're doing journalism correctly. And then you use the power of information to overpower like real bad guys, which is very exciting to me, right? Because yeah. you put people on blast and then the people turn on them and that's like the real tool, which is what I think I like about comedy where you have a perspective or you might pick the most fucked up perspective and then you argue for it and that's where you get the jokes because yeah. if you if you actually make some good points you're like oh, maybe we should kill the turtles yeah, you know, exactly. or whatever it is. <laughs> I don't really want to agree but he's got good points but yeah, yeah that's kind of where I've, what comedy's taught me to do like go the opposite way of what everyone else thinks it's like everyone's shitting on something why is it cool I gotta take the other side you know as yeah. a comedian well and also if you can't argue the other direction then your argument it invalidates your argument yeah because it's just hyperbole it's just it's just you screaming into the wind if you can't provide superior information to a weaker argument like look if 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 like I come from mixed martial arts if your jujitsu is better than mine then you'll win yeah but guess what if you're rusty if it's not sharp then you're gonna lose and it's that simple like how are you doing the work is are your tools sharp you know are we are we living are we alive are we humans are we surviving are we gonna survive you know can we outrun a tiger that shit man that shit yeah, still yeah i don't give can a shit a tiger? i don't give a shit how how like modern and comfortable and advanced you are at the end of the day we're not that high on the food chain we built a bunch of cool stuff to protect us and it's really important that we're always challenged because if you're not, then you're going to get weak, you're going to get flabby, and you're going to get eaten, one way or another. I, I that was the, the area of philosophy that I loved. That's just my my last little stick. It was called process thinking, where you have a uh, necessity, which means that like if you don't do the thing, that you're going to die, you, you're, you're going to get eaten or starve or whatever. If you don't prepare for winter, you freeze it, etc. Um, tradition, which means we don't really have. To do that now, because for whatever reason we've learned some technology or have knowledge that's, uh, you know, outpaced uh, just the raw elements. And then so we, we don't eat pork because the people who didn't eat pork because it would kill you, even though we can eat bacon now, uh, we still don't eat it because we're respecting the, uh, the necessity. And then we have dogma, which is why, why don't we eat pork? Is it because you go to hell? It's like, because I said so. And what we live in right now is like an age of totally like manufactured dogma. I think that the whole thing is dying out. But we have, they'll have dogma. They'll be like, oh, you can't do this. You can't say this. This is wrong. This is hate speech. This is blah, blah. And it's like, no, it's not. That you Tell me how that's a necessity. Tell me how, trace that back to the caves and show me how, you know, whatever the the issue is and when people buy into that shit it it makes it drives me fucking crazy well we were talking Especially about that last what were we talking about last night i think it's when we first got to chonkla's and we were parking we were talking about something and i go yeah i go because so many people hear things and because because of a huge collective says oh because this and this that nobody should do this or everybody should do this so nobody does their goddamn research and they all start doing it because a celebrity said it or a politician said it or whatever but nobody does their fucking research but because it's the trend or it's the big you know whatever on the news or you know what i mean like whatever it's like so people just follow suit and they fucking do it without doing their own research or you know what i mean anything like that it's like fashion has always been so gross to me i i I cannot stand it when people just do stuff just to do stuff and it's not just fashion i mean it's it's everything it's everything it's like just it's so many things in life in general well, it's expanded, but at the end of the day, it's like it's you see people like on Twitter, and they have like the blue check mark, and they have the the Ukraine flag, and whatever the trendy thing is. And I'm like, well, like you're getting most of that information from the news, and let's just talk basic economics. The news is a dead industry. I mean, you're not even you're it's not even really trendy. Well, a lot of things like do you remember you know that game I mean? Telephone? A yeah, lot of things right, are like the yeah. longest game of telephone, like. Somebody could say something and it wouldn't like 
a huge celebrity, let's just say that a huge celebrity says one thing that's not even fucking true, but they decide to put it on social media. And um, then the next thing you know, it's like a worldwide thing and it's not even true, but you know what? Everybody's gonna fucking believe, believe it because it, that yeah. person said it. And nobody's gonna, some people will do their research, you know, people are talking are about Joe Rogan right now. No, no, I'm just <laughs> yeah. saying that it's like just so many people just don't even do their research, but they go, oh, well, so-and-so said it, so I'm gonna believe it and I'm gonna stand by this. And it's like, no, it's like, get your head out of your fucking ass. Like, yeah. Yeah. Just if people are just more followers, nobody's a leader anymore. I mean, there's a few leaders left out there, but there's everybody just so many fucking followers anymore. And everybody gets in their own echo chambers now with social media. Right. Like you find what you like and the algorithm just feeds that to you. So people are only hearing what they want to hear and so they think that's fact. They think everyone else is seeing that same shit, but it's like no. Everyone's algorithm curates what they want to see. So everyone's just getting like reaffirmed from their TikTok and shit. Yeah. And like, there's no, you can't convince them otherwise. Cause it's like, I heard these smart people on TikTok say this. You can't convince me they're wrong. Right. It's well, fucking frustrating. It, what, it's, well, people it, think everything they read on the internet is 100% true. Yeah. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah, it's hilarious. The internet there's so is many 100%. people that are just like, well, I read it on the internet, so it's obviously true. And I'm like, okay. Well, there are also, there's like, there are people, some of them are grown ass adults, a lot of them are just like, Kids who are saying, I wonder how much really reaction I can get from talking shit. I remember I was on one of these. Uh, see, I started doing MMA back before it was uh, a thing that people did. Like, I literally didn't know anyone who practiced the sport who wasn't also. Uh, if you're a fan of the sport, you also practice the sport. There's no regular fans. Right. And I was. I made a comment about like, oh, I, I train with the on the one of these. I love. UFC forums or something on Facebook and I was like oh yeah I, I train with these guys and, and this is legit what you hear and, and I just kind of left it at that because I was like really thought it was a cool video the first comment was someone who said no you didn't like and I'm like this is like I was like that's adorable and I at that point I had I was like google me and I just left it at that but what the funny thing is that from that point forward it was a whole thread of all these keyboard warriors arguing over how whether or not I had punked this guy and they like Google me and like I've been doing it for so long like there's a lot of shit I've done that wasn't on Google they like go they have like the one where's your record or net worth it's like oh you had like 30 fights and you made like $1,200 and like yeah you're because you're retarded and you don't know how any of this shit works like it's it's fine but I always said that when we have real fans that's when the MMA that's like what we want we want a bunch of morons who are judging how to do the thing who don't do it, you know? Yeah. Although it was nice to have, like, the only people we dealt with back in the day were people who were, like, uh, they were converted hop keto. Like, when all of a sudden they were doing traditional karate and then MMA become trendy and they start saying, oh, we're doing grappling now or whatever. It's like, you watch some videos and stuff. But um, they, it, it's just it's just cool. Like, and you have, but there's so many, the point is there's so many shit talkers. Like, you have to be able to stand on your own two feet you've got to know why you can't just cite a bunch of other shit that's the worst too when people get in arguments on facebook like you can't you can't win that like because if you're arguing on facebook you're already in your own like comfort zone and most people do not like to be pulled out of that and no matter how convincing the evidence is you present them with or how good your argument is they're not going to change their mind because they're too stupid to understand their own argument. Why would they even go into, why would they look up yours? You know what yeah. I mean? So, yeah. that, and, and that, therein lies the beauty of comedy, which is where we're at trying to bring it back and let you guys talk a second. But it's just that it's all based in truth. You can't bullshit uh, laughs. Yeah. You can't fake it. You can't. If you get, there's three things I read in a book that make people involuntarily laugh the way you do in a comedy club. It's when you surprise them, when you embarrass them, or you make them realize something that they was true that they hadn't thought of or in a way that they hadn't thought yeah. of before. Yeah, okay, yeah. And, and that brings us full circle back to why we are, uh, the, we are the resistance. Getting on, get, not being PC, doing comedy, making people laugh. And really, it's, I think comedians are modern day philosophers. Because we're challenging ideas. That's yeah, the whole point. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, it's funny. It's like the way things have been going the past few years. People are like, do you ever find that you have to tone your stuff down? I said, honestly, I, I, I almost try to turn it up. It's like I... It's not that I'm trying to piss people off because I've always been more of an edgy or dirty comic. Yeah. But it's like I'm not going to turn myself down or tame things down. It's like I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. And if I happen to piss somebody off, then we can go meet toe to toe somewhere on a dark night and I will fucking beat the shit out of you if you want to. You <laughs> know what I mean? Will. Like, I will fight you. Yeah, so I will fight you. The like, these these are fight words, motherfucker, night. you know? <laughs> like, it's just, 
And on top of that, bottom line, these are just jokes, people. If you can't laugh, then there's something fucking wrong with you. Yeah, that's the thing. These are people just jokes. Getting, and, they get, okay, people go getting ahead. pissed off about a joke when somebody was just trying to be funny. They're trying to make you laugh from it, and then it, you took it wrong, and you're like, fuck you for that. It's like they were coming from a good place originally, and you have to have the, the wiggle room to try things and fail. And you can't hold that against somebody unless they're you know saying like n words or something terrible. But well, well that's that's understood fighting words. But Blake, you you have started comedy I guess the last two years. You've been in Missoula, Montana, a much more I guess like a woke scene, which is weird because yeah. I always think of Montana as like northwestern Alabama. Oh, it's or something. well, no, he was saying okay, he was saying earlier, and I was telling him that he needs. To, you're, you're saying you might talk about it on stage, right? Like. Like, they don't have black people in Montana. And, I mean, all my a family's few, from yeah. there, so it's, like, a few. All my family's from there, so it's, like, I did a huge part of growing up there. Yeah, there's, you see a little bit more Mexicans, but, yeah, we don't see black people in Montana. So, like, he yeah. was saying earlier that he might make a joke about it, about it because I was, like, yeah, I go, like, how tourists come here and they, um, weren't you saying something well, yeah, about... Yeah, like, how in Asia, how white pe- like, people will want to take pictures with white people. That's, like how it's gotten in Missoula. People are so woke, they see a black person, like, hey, I want you to know I'm not racist. Like, hey, how are you doing, you know? Like, yeah, yeah. Well, that, yeah, and I was like, well, it's kind of like the street performers here when people put on, like, a Batman costume, they take a picture with them, then they give them a couple yeah, bucks. Exactly. And when they take a picture with the black person, then they give them a couple bucks. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> it's going to look great on the gram for me. I, Show I, people I have black No, friends. but it's like, so all, um, so I did a big part of my growing up in Butte, Montana, and that's where I went to beauty school as mm-hmm. well, right? And I want to say, in all my years, I mean, seriously, you're getting a phone call. I don't care. Okay. Um, <laughs> in all my years, yeah. I mean, it's like, but you know what, though? Right. It's so fucking cold in Montana. I mean, I'm sorry, but the black people are the smarter ones. Yeah. It's like, who the fuck wants to go there? And on top of that, Butte, Montana... I'm sorry if any of my family's watching, but Butte sucks, okay? So if anybody cool is, bars. if anybody, yeah, a couple of cool bars. You know why? Because you have to stay drunk to live there, and it's so fucking cold. It's one of something that warms you up to be out and about. So if anybody, the black people are the smart ones that never fucking went to that cold-ass fucking state. Yeah. You go to visit, you don't stay there. But all my family, born and raised there, they're like, yeah, but Butte is the best place on earth, so why would you ever want to leave? And some of my family has world traveled and they still have never wanted to live anywhere else. I'm like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Well, there's a real purity to like being out in nature. I mean, there's, you know, it's probably, it's probably like the third most likely place to be attacked by a bear or whatever. But, but it all, but Montana is really beautiful. It's gorgeous. If you have your, if you have your philosophy and your business and just like what you want to do locked down, it is a nice peaceful place. So the world can be like kind of complex. I used to like seek out chaos. You know, I spent five years essentially living out of a bag, being an MMA coach in different countries in Asia. And, And I was really into that. I was like, you know, the more adventure, the better. And now I'm to a point where uh, you know, I've, I've had adventures, and like I'd really like something maybe even more peaceful than Las Vegas. You know, it'd be nice to live in the suburbs and like Louisiana and just chill out. Or, you know, I, I think I might want to check out Austin just because that's the big scary next step for comedy. I think is blowing up. You're seeing that really come up, but also they have the suburbs and a lot of to other each things their happening. Own. You yeah, have a kid, we'll you have have a kid too. To each their yeah, own. You have well, a kid too. Everybody has their own opinions. I don't agree with that. I mean, yeah. I would like to go spend more time in Austin. Right. I don't I know if that's a place. I wouldn't want to live there. Austin is a weird culture. I don't know how. I've visited a few times. I don't know uh, how I would vibe there as a resident. You know, I know that it's got all the stuff that I like. You know, it's got like high levels of everything. It's got mixed martial arts. It's got uh, nature, fitness, nutrition. It's got comedy. You know, it's it's starting to and it's really growing fast. But that's almost a turnoff too. You yeah, know, when it, it gets seems trendy. like it's oversaturated already. Everyone's going there. Yeah. Well, that's what it was. It's like because when the pandemic hit, like Austin and there was a couple other places that people just really freaking flocked to. And but Austin was a really big one, especially Montana from well. L.A. Yeah, because like. Um, all my family in Butte because, uh, like, for instance, I have an aunt that has a house in Butte. She had this cool three-story Victorian-style house that they bought it back in the 70s, I want to say. And she owned it for, like, 30-something years. And um, when she sold it, she only made $14,000 off of it. Wow. Yeah. Like, that's how bad Sound- the economy is in Butte. But now Sounds in the past, haunted. 
in the past couple of years. Well, it was you haunted by her it. fucking cunt ass because she's the biggest fucking bitch I've ever met in my life. And I hope she is watching. Fuck you. Um, Aunt, Le- Aunt Lena. Angie Aunt Lena. Trump. I'll call you out. Aunt Lena, Fuck you're a fucking you, cunt. I hate you. Yeah. Um, why did my dad die? Because you should have been the one that died. Um, Jesus. That's how bad I hate her. No, that's how bad I hate her. I could, I, we, we didn't, she's not even worth explaining how bad she made things in my life so many times. So anyways. Um, can we just out all of our family members? Yeah, we can. Fuck you want to talk about Cynthia? yours? No. Anyways, so, um, but my Uncle Kenny, my favorite uncle, um, he was telling me that when all the pandemic stuff was happening, he said that the economy just started booming in Butte. And same thing like up in your area in Kalispell where all our other friends live. Um, he said people were buying houses in Butte sight unseen, um, just for outrageous, oh, outrageous prices. That. Yeah. We were, me and my lady were about to look into buying a house right when COVID happened. And then just a flood of people came in buying shit sight unseen and it ruined our chance to like own a house in Missoula. And we're at the point now where it's like, we got to get the fuck out of here. Cause it's too expensive to every, like a fucking meal is like 15 to 18 dollars for like a cheeseburger and fries you can't own a house the rent's so fucking high are you guys so still getting paid high. the same amount of money yeah. in your job like, seat that's minimum wage is still like yeah. fucking nine ten dollars it's doing the same fucking thing yeah. here it's like i don't i don't understand that so we say fuck you to anybody who moved there from california and shit and it's like a known thing if anybody asks how cool Montana is, you go, no, it's terrible. Don't go there. There's yeah, bears. Don't go there. Don't come yeah, there's bears. Yeah. It's cold. Yeah. It's terrible. It's not beautiful at all. There's The mountains suck. You know, All the water's polluted. Don't go there. Don't go uh, to Montana. Tell me it's like a lot of parasites or something. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's a, it's just, it was California became so weird so fast. I mean, every single piece of legislation that I saw happen there throughout the pandemic and everything... You've got to look at the end game whenever it's a politician or it's it's never they never say it directly, but you have to look at what the cost and benefit is of the actual thing. Like literally play it out, put it forward like four years. What what direction is this thing gonna push things? People are so like goldfish brain where they they hear a thing and they see a headline and they're like, but it sounds good. They're like, oh, you know, we want to save turtles or whatever. You know, we were talking about the. Like the, like the plastic straw thing or what? It doesn't really make functional sense. We talk about uh, curbing pollution, you know, and how they're putting all these crazy restrictions, which is resulting in them being allowed to tax the shit out of people and take more money. It's ultimately just leading to higher taxes. And, and But you're not looking at India. You're not looking at China. You're not looking at Indonesia. You're not looking at places that are far you know this is not really about saving the earth this is a this is a, an excuse to scam people yeah. i mean it's just gangsters doing gangster stuff and i don't understand how any band in las vegas doesn't see it coming because the whole city was founded by gangsters that's the way i mean this this whole city is a, a laundromat for money i mean that's the whole point anyone who's seen the mobster movie and some of those characters are real people and some of their relatives are still involved in politics here and it's not like why would anyone be surprised like to go legitimate a mobster doesn't just start a business and then cut ties with a the mob, they get into politics. That's how you get into politics is you have you need to have money. And then like if Pablo Escobar was, became prime minister of uh, Colombia, he's not going to make it harder to traffic cocaine. You know, like use your brain, people. Like people never think, Pat, this stuff makes me so angry. But I was gaslit my entire life. I was raised by a guy who was in the closet and then my mom played along with it for 17 years. And uh, that's probably an oversimplification from their perspective, but that's how it was for me. Our upbringings are always so interesting to hear yeah. about. I mean, it's like, I'm, I'm like, finally, people are like, oh, well, when you were a kid, things were so nice, and we didn't have to worry about this, and there's less stress, and being an adult is hard. I'm like, man, I like being an adult. Being an adult, I feel like I understand the world. I was just wide-eyed, like, white-knuckling it, just, okay, I, that doesn't make sense. I don't understand it, but I guess I'm just going to let it happen mm-hmm. type of thing, you know, which is a terrible way to leave. You're just chronically depressed all the time. You have no... I feel uh, that. You know what I mean? And then... No! <laughs> oh, my God. I could so, tell you guys some things about my fucking childhood, and I should be the most depressed fucking person in this room. But you repressed it. Properly. No, I didn't. I fucking dealt with it. Yeah. I dealt with it, and I fucking washed yeah, it away. It wasn't until I became older do. that I found a whole new realm of depression, and I still deal with it, but I still put on a fucking happy face. I think I masturbate way more than you guys do. I think that's, that's like true, one of the best yeah. ways to deal with it. Yeah. Challenge accepted. Yeah, seriously, I'll fucking, I'll, I would top you. I would seriously top challenge you. I'll challenge you to a whack off. Yeah, I'll challenge episode. you to a whack off. I'll win. I'll seriously win. 
All um, right. Angie has to keep her vibrator plugged in twenty four seven. I don't plug a vibrator in because rechargeable <laughs> ones suck. Okay. Angie, it's all back to double A's. You've been talking about masturbation on stage in Las Vegas for over ten years. Uh, tell us about the scene. How was it when you started, and what is it like now? Who are the comedians that you're paying attention to, and what do you, what do you, you know, what are you uh, into comedy wise? Um, okay, so when I first started, uh, where should I begin? So when I first started, there was only probably ten comics in the scene in Las Vegas, and uh, I, uh, a girl named Miracle Speakman. Uh, I had reached out to a guy, like, I, I think I found them on Craigslist. They were doing a show, a guy named Mike Milton was doing a show with Miracle Speakman. And uh, Matt Markman was the other comic on the show. And so I reached out to Mike Milton and I was like, hey, I want to do comedy. I've always wanted to do comedy. And he fucking ripped into me and he was just like, don't even bother, blah, blah, blah. Like, he was a fucking dick to me. Whoa. And so I said, you know what? I was like, I'm going to do comedy whether you help me or not. Because that's when I had made the choice, like, I'm going to start doing comedy. But there was, like, nothing. Nowhere, nothing to really do in this town unless you were on the strip doing it in the few comedy clubs we had back then. This is like, what, like 2012 or something like that? No, it was yeah. before that. This was back in um, 2008 or seven, maybe. Wow. Yeah. And so... Um, so then I responded to Mike and I said, you know what? I said, I'm going to do stand up whether you help me or not. I was like, and one day I said, you're going to fucking see me accepting an award. I said, and you're going to remember this conversation and go, you know what? That's the girl that I didn't fucking help. And he goes, you know what? Fine. This is the show that we're doing. You can come down and see how the pros do it. So anyways, I went to that show. I took my little sister with me and that's when I met Miracle. And she goes, fuck Mike. Like they knew each other back from Reno. Miracle started in Reno and she had been doing comedy for like four or five years at that point. And she goes, I'll take you under my wing, Angie. She goes, I'll show you all the ins and outs and the do's and don'ts. So she did. She taught me how to do stand-up. She taught me about how to do segues and callbacks and don't step on your laughs and everything like that. So um, probably within six months or something like that, um, she had me do a show with her um, I and I told her I was like I don't want to do like a guest spot or anything I said I want to MC. so the first three shows I did with her they were um, fundraiser shows for like an animal shelter and I just emceed it and I was so fucking nervous the first year and a half I did stand up you guys I had to be so drunk that I wasn't slurring my words like I was so terrified of public speaking but the drive and the want to do stand up was stronger than that anyway so then after those three shows that we did, we did them at Johnny Max and Henderson. Um, if anybody knows where that is, best fucking pickle chips I've ever had in my life. Um, and then after that, we had talked to um, Charlie Fox. He owned the bunkhouse back then and Meatheads. He reached out to us and he said, I want to do an open mic at my bar, Meatheads. Little tiny hole in the wall on Charleston and Decatur. So we started that's, running. That's the hard hat lounge or what used to be, right? And no. now, are they something? No? No. Meatheads no. is not Meat the Meatheads was on Charleston and Decatur. Oh, totally. Um, yeah. And so, um, so we started doing Meatheads, and um, that was on Tuesdays. So that's when I met, let me see if I can rattle off some names. I met Gooch, I met Diaz, I met Jason Harris, I met John Hilder, I met Brant Tobler, I met uh, Booyah, I met Ricky Byrne. I met Anton Davis, or excuse me, Anton Knight, Antoine Davis. Antoine is still around, but he's doing a lot of other stuff. I met, uh, God, there's so many other names that I'm not thinking. But again, those names were all around back then, you guys. I mean, that's that's the list of the, uh, that's, yeah, that's that was, the I mean, that's a lot of the Las Vegas legends that are still around. That's the old guy. And yeah, it's like, and um, Mike Simpson, um, he was doing Monday nights at Mulligan's. And uh, Diaz had Monday nights as well, but that didn't last very long because somebody got shot in the parking lot, not during comedy nights, but another night, but they didn't want to do comedy anymore there afterwards. So yeah, they really killed. So we did Meatheads on Tuesdays and then they had Monday at Mulligan's and yeah, they really killed there. <laughs> and, <you>. um, <laughs> and so, um, so yeah, for the longest time, we just basically had Mulligan's on Mondays and Meatheads on Tuesdays, and we had basically the same like 10, 12 comics. Gabe in Alaska was around. Um, anyways, so, and I can keep rattling off names as I go. Anyways, so um, Marty Forrest, he's passed away since then. Um, so anyways, uh, I keep saying anyways, I'm just trying to like recall all these these facts and these memories and stuff like that. So who, who of them are, are still out there doing it? Like I know Gooch is still around. And talking. All of them. 
Yeah, everybody's still doing it. Yeah, all of them. Like I said, Great. Antoine Davis, he was part of like the improv scene. And a lot of names came along shortly within a couple, because it's like, okay, so we basically had, you know, Mike had Mondays, I had Tuesdays. And then after a while, um, more people started coming out. Like, like Tuesdays started growing, Tuesdays started growing. Like, I think it took like eight months to a year um, for Meatheads really to catch on. It really took a while for it to catch on. But once it caught on, it was like fucking wildfire and we had to add um, Thursdays. So Meatheads went on Tuesdays and Thursdays for six years. What is what is Meatheads now? This is a Nothing. When Charlie decided to close it, um, I think there was a Cricket Wireless on one side and a Jamba Juice on the other. So now I think it might be like a Chipotle or something. And oh, on okay. the corner of Charleston and Decatur used to be a Taco Bell. I think it's a drive through Starbucks now. All right. Charlie just came in one morning and said, bar closed forever. Uh. So right after that, he said, hey, you want to do an open mic at my Hard Hat Lounge? So I ran Hard Hat for a while. And then when I decided to uh, move to L.A., I gave it to uh, Bobby and Trez, Bobby Stodds and Trez. Okay. And back then, Bobby was called Honky Be Cool. <laughs> so Bobby came along shortly after that. But yeah, Trez is still from back in the day as well. Um, <clears throat> But anyways, yeah, so like Meatheads was like a like a home base for a lot of people, you know, it's like, and it just, so many comics got their start at Meatheads and it just, it was just such a fun, cool place, but it was tiny. I mean, it was one of those skinny long bars in a little strip mall like everybody sees. It's in that Walmart on Charleston Decatur that's in that, that little plaza there. But yeah, it was fun. Like every time we had a year anniversary of Tuesdays or a year anniversary of Thursdays, I would bring my barbecue grill in and we would put it behind. And so we'd always have free food on the anniversaries and then we'd do like dollar beers and stuff like that. So it's like, but it was just so welcoming and fun and open and it was a great show. We always had good times there. And then I started running shortly after we started doing the uh, Tuesdays. Uh, Charlie also owned the bunkhouse. So we started doing um, uh, showcases on first Fridays at the bunkhouse. And then he also owned a motel that was like within walking distance from there. So he'd always give the comics a um, hotel room for Friday nights. Oh, that's cool. So Miracle and I did that for a while, and then um, we met Tadri Hipburn, and we brought her on as a third partner, and then we started running shows at a swingers club called The Power Exchange. So then we took on um, Tuesdays and Wednesdays. This is before we added Thursdays. We took on Tuesdays and Wednesdays open mic, and then we'd have Friday, Saturday showcases. Saturday, we'd do a showcase at um, Power Exchange, and then we'd have the hotel for people, so then we'd bring in a lot of L.A. comics and stuff like that. And it was nice. I mean, we could pay people and all this other stuff, and they'd have a room and all that other good stuff. Um, and also doing a show at a swingers club was very interesting. I have tons of fucking stories about that. I bet. That's um, got to be... What a weird name for a swinger. I'm not appropriate, Well, it's out of San Francisco. Yeah, the power exchange. I mean, yeah, I bet people are getting tired. Were people still in, like, gimp gear when they were in the audience? Um, well, okay, so the show would start at 8, and it's a two-story, 10,000-square-foot building with 23 themed rooms. So the Whoa. room that we would do our show in... Party. Um... Well, the room that we do our show in was upstairs off to one side, and it was one of the bigger rooms, and they built a stage for us. But, I mean, the stage was only a few inches off the ground, and um, it had two stripper poles on it. And so they tell people, they're like, because the club would open at 9, we start our show at 8. So when the club opened at 9, they're like, there's a comedy show going on upstairs. They're like, and you can go watch, but there's no sex or nudity allowed in that room while it's going on. So we had, like, chairs and couches and stuff in that room so people could watch. And then there was, like, a queen-size box spring and mattress in the corner of the room that when all the when you know when all the seats were full people would just sit on the edge of that bed just to you know watch the show but, yeah so you know the club would open at nine so by the time our show finished um you know everything was going on in the club so um fridays and saturdays were i think they're like their m nights or something like that it okay. was something like it was something like that. So when our show finished, we would go downstairs. So one room was like a medieval room, and the other room was like a, <laughs> like a dungeon. Wow! So you'd watch all this crazy S and M shit. And one night, I wasn't there for this. I left early, and they said that they watched a chick get fucked with a crocodile Dundee knife. And what? they said that yeah, they said that it wasn't Dundee? like he was doing this to her. They said he did it really, really slow, and he like cut his thumb to show the audience how sharp it was. And I was like, he did it like, on, like on stage, like this is a yeah, like he did it as like a like a show for everybody in like wow. the dungeon room, and he was like he had her like tied to this like table I got thing, like ghost and he had like he had a plastic sheet on the floor so that people could see that there was not going to be any blood shed, but he showed them on his thumb that the knife was sharp, and then he fucked her really really slow with it. To, and I was like, at what point does somebody get in their life where they say? I want to 
to get fucked by a knife. You know what I mean? Like, what is wrong with you? Yeah. So then, like, my my business partners text me the next day. They go, you shouldn't have left early that night, last night. They're like, we just had this girl get fucked by a knife. They're like, and it wasn't just like a knife. They're like, it was a knife, you know? Like, Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Knife. And I was like, uh, no, I think I'm kind of glad that I left. Like, but yeah, we saw all sorts of other shit. It's one of those things you think you want to see, and then when you see it, you're like, oh, God, this is lifelong trauma now. Yeah, so we saw all sorts of weird shit happen. Like, like one time we were actually doing a show in that. I, did I tell you the story the other day? I told, might have told somebody else, but this is my favorite story about the fucking power exchange. We were doing a show, and um, again, no sex or nudity allowed in that fucking room. And there, again, there was that box spring and mattress in the back of the room, and our headliner was on stage. It was Derek Stroman. You know, Stro, if you watch this, I fucking love you. He's taken a little bit of a step back. We're hoping he gets his ass back out. But so he was our headliner that night. He had like five minutes left. So there's a woman named Stephanie that she had a boutique there that if you came in to get, okay, because we'd have a lot of straight men that would come into her boutique and they would have her make them look like a woman. And then they'd go in and they'd walk around the club all night dressed like a woman. But at the end of the night, they have a locker room with showers where you could shower it all off, put your man clothes back on. And then, then you leave for the night. You know what I yeah, mean? So it's like, that was like, perfect yeah. Perfect sense. So, so I, I, I learned a lot there, you know, cause I mean, these guys would come up to me and hit on me and I'm like, they're like, no, I'm a straight man. I just like to cross dress. I'm like, oh, okay. You know, again, yeah, this is a long time ago. So anyways, so Derek Stroman's five minutes left on the stage and they knew that there was no sex or nudity allowed in that room. So Stephanie comes upstairs She's a goddamn employee there, so she knew better than anybody else. She comes up there, and Stephanie's a tranny, and she's one of the most passable trannies I've ever seen. She comes out with her big fake titties, huge, out, right? And she had clothes on from the, you know, from here down. And then she has a guy by his wrist behind her. She walks between the audience and the stage. Well, the guy she had by his wrist, he was completely naked. Yeah. So she walks between the stage and the audience. She takes him to that that uh, mattress and box springs in the back of the room. She lays this guy stomach down and she starts fisting his asshole. Oh my God. Wow. And there's one guy sitting on the edge of the mattress watching the show and he stays there. So he's watching the comedy show while some guy's getting fisted right behind him. You think it's hard doing comedy when there's just a drunk loud person in the back. Yeah. So. I need to use that as my closer. So, (laughs) so anyway, so then Strowman's like, um, okay, I think I'm good here. Yeah. So he's like, yeah, hey, all right, have a good night. Anyway, so you couldn't smoke in there. And so right outside, you know, right outside of that room, you like walk through another room and was this humongous patio. So we all go out there, we'd smoke weed, smoke cigarettes, whatever. So we all go out there. The guy that was sitting on the, the mattress while the fisting was going on, he comes out there with us. His name is Richard. So I go, hey, man, I go, why didn't you move? And he goes, well, I didn't want to make them feel uncomfortable. Uh, <laughs> what a gentleman. <laughs> Too late, unless that's like their. Oh, happy another place. comic that was around back then, Jeff Grant. Rest in peace, my friend. He died a year ago. Yeah, almost Jeff Grant. a few days ago was the the anniversary of it. But yeah, Jeff Grant was back around back then too. Can you fist my ass tonight for my closer? Do you want that's me to? Amazing, yeah. Do you really want me to hand puppet show? you? Yeah. You should really, you should really come to the Halloween show at Backstop. You you have not been, Angie, right? No, I haven't. When, when are they doing that? Do you know the date? They said like the 20 something. It's like well, right, it's so right. So I'm doing Stoner Halloween. Rob show on the 28th, but I don't have. Well, okay, I got invited to a Halloween party on the 29th at a mansion that's catered by one of my co workers. Her name's Paula, so they call it Halloween. All right. And I'm like, oh, wow. And I was going to be Freddy Krueger this year because I was Freddy Krueger two years ago, but it was all like COVID, so nobody got to saw my, see my kick ass costume. Are but you like a sexy Freddy Krueger? I you... was a sexy Freddy, but the thing was, is I like fucked myself up with all the latex makeup so i mean i was melted i mean i wasn't i wasn't pretty so you and looked I didn't more want like freddy krueger after you took the mask off huh you looked more like freddy krueger after you took the mask off. i looked really cool after i took it off yeah but i looked gross with you it on freaky. i showed him pictures i i mean i looked yeah, pretty good yeah good. i looked freaky i had the contacts in and everything like that i did a tom bomb show that night oh nice so trying like having those contacts in and then when your eyes move and it takes a second for the contacts to move that fucks you up even more. Because everybody knows what a Tom Bomb show is, and if you don't, um, can I even talk about it on here? Should I? I don't yeah, know. you can talk yeah. about it. Tom Bomb runs the psychedelic show. Yeah, he runs the psychedelic the, show. All over so, the country. He does all it. over the country, yeah. So it's like, it's 
a psych you have to do a some type of a psychedelic you to do like the show. yeah you meet up like an hour ahead of time and you do mushrooms or acid and then when it kicks in you go on stage or molly right or molly, molly that's that like the other too. yeah and uh then whatever comes out of your head comes out of your head yeah here i feel like that would be a real low pressure set to do because you do like 10 minutes and it, you don't worry no, about no i was headlining that night i had stuff. to do yeah. i had to do 30 minutes Oh yeah. What, yeah. What, what did you mushrooms, acid? I did molly? mushrooms. Yeah. Um, and the thing is, is like, here, I'll just let me pull up a picture of how I was dressed that night. Um, yeah, it was a good costume, more like Freddy Cougar. <laughs> Freddy Cougar. Uh, All right. Damn it. Let's see how well I can. That was Blake Powell with the Freddy Cougar comment. Yeah. Can you see that? Oh wow, that is a gnarly yeah, looking I'm costume. Like, I don't know how well people can like see that. Here, I'll, I'll hold it up on my camera. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, right here. Look at that. Wow. That is Ms. Angie Crumb. So I was gonna do that again this year, but Aiden Park, that was gonna be here with us today, he is gonna be Freddy Krueger for a musical for Halloween. So when I showed him this costume, he goes, "Oh my God, can I try that on?" So now Aiden is borrowing my Freddy, my sexy Freddy costume to um, be in this musical. Over he was Halloween. so funny. I'm sorry you couldn't make it today. Yeah, he had other stuff going on. He agreed to it, and then he ended up having to cancel. But he'll be on one of your other future podcasts. Shout out I to Aiden yeah. Parts. yeah, I love you, Aiden, my gay husband. That he is so gay. He is. He, he was really. <laughs> yes. Like he's a very funny man, all personality. What a, he was a funny. He had a, did a good set. I told him if he ever turns time. straight, that I'm going to be the first person that fucks him. Yeah. I think Aiden is so hot. <laughs> I don't think a lot of Asian guys are hot, and I think Aiden is so fucking hot. He's really he's tall. Asian boy. He's tall and for he's a really, Korean. Well, and he's, part of the reason he's, why... Um, he's built like a model. I mean, that, he's got that coat hanger build. And he's got a really nice chiseled jawline, too, which yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm a jawline girl. He's got so. nice symmetry. So when he put my costume on, it didn't fit him, of course, like a dress, but it fit him quite well, like a... Like, a, like just like a regular like the Freddy sweater except for the slices in the stomach so yeah yeah, yeah but he does he's got a nice build and stuff like that and yeah the nice broad shoulders does he do modeling in, in LA he's an um, LA guy I think right? he has done a lot of modeling yeah. um, but he does Aiden wrote a book um, and he's an inspirational speaker and he um, is a life coach as well and um, I invited him out tonight and he goes and I was like let's just go sit in the audience and watch Blake and he goes I might be a little comedied out and I was like oh come on yeah. So, I don't know. We might see Aiden tonight. Maybe we can get him to come to OSHA tonight. We'll see. But, yeah, he's just an amazing person. If anybody can be... And I know he's going to sit here and tell me to shut up if he watches this, but you should really feel graced in the presence of Aiden because he is such an amazing human being. He he's really is. A, he really is an earth angel. He really is. Yeah, I can't wait to talk to him. Uh, Angie, what do we have uh, going on in the scene right now? It's very different than it used to be when you started. But we have... I feel like we're, I guess it's the post-COVID boom, but a lot of the new people that have only been here for a year are pretty strong. They're a lot stronger than me at one year or whatever in Vegas. You um, know? I'm probably somebody that it's not good to ask that because I moved back here two years ago after being wrongfully evicted out of my fucking house in L.A. And also, I'm not the type of person that likes to return back to somewhere where I lived. I was still coming back here all the time and doing my hair clientele. And I was going out and doing comedy in the places that I was contracted to do. Um... So I don't go out in the scene as much as I should, maybe, but um, the few that I know that are up and comers, I think they're talented. But I mean, like, I don't know the scene like you do. You know what I mean? Like half of these names, I'm just right. like, who the fuck are you? You know what I mean? Or some people come up and they're like, oh, hey, nice to see you. I'm like, I'm sorry, who are you? And I'm not trying to be rude. It's, you know what I mean? It's like, so um, one thing I will say that's different is there's a lot more comics. Um, it's funny because I thought that I used to always say that the scene here was like a bunch of teenage girls on their periods. And I was like, oh, you know what? Once the scene grows more, that'll go away. And it seems like now that the scene has grown more, it's just gotten worse. It's almost like they just added more buildings to the high school. Right, um, right, right. Like we've, and the thing that really sucks is like we could have more venues, but so many people have ruined it that all these venues that have had comedy before don't ever want to have it again because so many people have ruined it because there's so many of you that are fucking shitty. I'm sorry. So many of you shouldn't even be fucking doing comedy. You suck. Okay. <sighs> but you know what? We see it in every city. We see it in every city. Yeah, like I was telling up. somebody yesterday that a lot, yeah, but like we see it, um, like in LA, a lot of open mics, you can't just go in and sign up the way you used to or the way you can in other cities because 
you have all these crazy fucks that have it in their head that they're the next big thing or something like that. Well, you you have that whole showbiz Hollywood thing in L.A. that we don't have out here where there's so many people that are actors trying to be comedians and so on, right? Like, it's like, yeah, but it's like, so they're basically, like doing improv or they're in acting class and like, oh, you should try comedy. And they're not really comedians so much as they just like attention. Well, and also, like, I, I, they say that, like, a lot of casting directors would rather hire comics because they're, they're more comfortable with making an ass out of themselves and they're just more loose and whatever. And, um, but, like, the other thing, too, it's like, there's just so many people that, uh, like, they have to do a lot of booked open mics is what I was, the point I was trying to get to. So you don't just walk in and sign up. You actually, there's, you actually have to, what, what do you mean booked open mic? Like, like wise guys where you sign up a week ahead and they make the list ahead of time? Yeah, kind of yeah. like that, yeah. The wise guys system works pretty good, I think, because it is open mic and anyone can do it and it's sort of first come, first serve, but... The people that are there, the open micers that do get on the list and put the effort in, it's just a tiny bit of effort. But if you put up just the minimal amount of effort, it really does – it does a lot for separating the serious from the people who are just kind of bored. Yeah, well, and also it's like – again, it's like you have a lot more crazy people in L.A. that just – again, sometimes you just want to spend 15 minutes inside somebody's brain to just wonder like – where in the fuck do you think any of this is coming from? Or, or, yeah. like, well, you yeah. ever watch the Beetlejuice cartoons where she goes in, where Lydia goes into Beetlejuice's head for like a day or something? It's like, that's what it always makes me think of. It's like, wow, we are really in crazy town. Right. Yeah. Because that's what a lot of these fucking LA, they're not even comics. They're not even open micers. They're seriously a bunch of like raid zones and kids scurries. They're people right. like me who are like, I could do that. No, <laughs> no. Because, I mean, it's like, yeah, but here's the thing. You are a sane person that watched it and studied it. You wrote and wrote and wrote. It's like, and you are somebody that actually is making progression and you're good at it, you know? Well, but you, also, you if so... you sucked at it, you'd be like, okay, I'm not very good at this. I need you to know, do better. You I need to either do better right? or people... Well, after my time here, it's like, fuck, I got to step it up. <laughs> yeah, that's how I was. What my like second open mic I ever did was in Austin at Kick Butt Coffee, which is a... It's just a giant coffee shop. They got a big stage and they have a huge open mic. And it's everybody is good. I was blown away by the, the difference in level between the scene in Austin, uh, at least uh, like four years ago, and the scene in Las Vegas. I think mm-hmm. Vegas is a little bit. Vegas has always been like its, its own creature, though, which is what I like because all the, the insanity that's been going on the last few years, Vegas has maintained sort of a, a, itself a weird oasis which is a very mob move you know like look we're going to do what we want to do here and if you want to come play by the rules and hang out with us that's cool but otherwise you guys you know, enjoy LA you enjoy Hollywood or San Francisco or whatever um, what, what do you uh, Angie you, you, have you been to we've got a lot of book shows right now that's one thing Diaz talks about a lot is how if you're a professional comedian you can come into Vegas right now and you could perform seven nights a week like book shows there's so many of them that you can get on if you well, network a little bit. Diaz and I were just talking about that the other day because I have a couple of possible venues coming into, you know, that I might start running soon. And we were saying Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It's like we need more stuff on those days. So those are the ones I'm going to try to push if these venues actually come into to fruition or whatever. But um, I have a couple of comedian friends. Like it went from this is a difference from years ago to now. Comedian friends that I've been friends with the whole time, they used to say, Vegas is one of the best scenes in the world. Right. To Vegas is one of the shittiest scenes I have ever been in. It is so toxic. And these are comics that I've known for years. Like I said, I've known them for years. They travel the world. They go to almost every fucking city. And they're like, what the fuck happened to Vegas? They're like, it went from being one of the best scenes to one of the shittiest, most toxic scenes. What do you mean by toxic? Like, how do you, how would you... <sighs> Um, I think because there's so many comics now, there's not enough rooms and there's too much fucking drama and people play into the drama way too much. I was telling somebody two nights ago, we were talking about some just recent drama and I said, you know what? Instead of playing into the drama, I said, do this, write a joke, write a few jokes, contact some bookers instead of playing into the drama and trying to get more people to feed into it. Do that. Be constructive. Be positive with your energy instead of trying to get more people to hate that person or watch that video or whatever. You know what I mean? Put it in a more positive spin. But so many people, again, more people would rather gravitate towards the negative than the positive. It's like, but 
again, like it's just rise above it. Yeah, rise I think above those it. Like, people, it's like a thing of jealousy, and they can't write funny jokes to go that way. So they have to. So it's like you okay. So it's like if ahead. you want to just keep sharing that negative video, then why don't you keep watching it and pick it apart and write your own fucking jokes you want about it instead of trying to get people to watch it for the for the publicity or the 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 hits on the video you know what i mean it's like yeah well there's no such thing as bad publicity no I mean, there's that, no such thing of bad fact. publicity no i know that i know that and but i'm just saying somebody, it's like well what, this person sent the video to me and, and it's what something video that, are you talking about i'm you talking about like, the one of you and ty Oh, the one in the yeah. interview that I did. Yeah. Check out the Paprika podcast. Yeah, so YouTube. it's like the video of him and Ty. This person sent it to me, and everybody knows about it, and I've seen it, and Ty is a good friend of mine, and I will go to bat for Ty any day of the fucking week, okay? If anybody wants to talk shit about Ty, I'm going to fucking go toe-to-toe with you because Ty is a friend of mine, and I'm always going to fucking stick up for him, okay? He's an amazing human being. So, anyways, this person sent me the video, and I responded to him. I go, why did you send me that? And so I saw him out a couple nights ago and he was just like, oh, you know what? He goes, it just said, do you want to send this to the top 50 people on your thing or whatever? And I'm like, okay, well, I've never seen that on Instagram, but whatever. And so that was my response to him. I go, instead of doing that, I said, why don't you write jokes instead? Because he's a fairly new comic. I said, why don't you write jokes instead? I said, or contact some bookers. And he goes, you know what, Angie? He goes, I see your point. He goes, I get that. I get that. And I said, you know what I said? Also, I said, Ty's been in this scene a long time. He's been in comedy a long time. He's very talented and he's had to deal with a lot of shit. I said, so I go, if you're even here in 10 years, because I'm sorry, a lot of you won't be. You have so much drive and passion towards comedy now. Cause I've been in it 13 years. June was 13 years for me. And we see so many people come and go. And for as much as you love comedy, life happens. You know, like I have friends that they are so fucking talented and they should be in comedy, but you know what? They end up getting married. They have kids or their job is so demanding. They just can't do comedy because they're getting paid. So, you know what I mean? It's like, so if you're still around in 10 years, it's like, even if you're not friends with somebody that you had a beef with in comedy or whatever, you know, like speaking about this whole thing recently with Ty. So I told this guy, I go, if you're still around in 10 years, I said, there might be a level of respect that builds just because you have that love and respect for comedy and you've gotten good at it and you're getting booked and you finally start seeing it from perspectives like he and I do. I said, you and him might actually be friends in 10 years. And he goes, well, I don't know about that. I said, Tenure, tenure makes such a big... It's so important in, in comedy. It, it, I've always said that comedy and mixed martial arts are so similar as far as industries because it really, at the end of the day, it's just you. And the comedians or the... If you're a fighter and you're trying to make it, it really only matters what you do, what you promote, how you train, what how you're networking. I mean, it's all... It's very, very similar. It's a type... It's athletic show business, but it's the same type of deal where it really is all on you. You're on stage. It's all on you. This is you... Uh, pre- pre- performing, presenting what you've worked on, and if you do good, then you do good, and if you do bad, you've got to figure out why you did bad and fix it. It's not the audience's fault, it's not the booker's fault, it's not anybody's fault but yourself because you're the only person on stage, you're the only person saying stuff. You can't lock in. It's something you got to practice, and so anybody who hasn't been doing it that long uh, should really listen to anybody who's been doing it longer than them, even if that person is not someone you agree with because you have there are things that they absolutely know things that you don't know. Always listen to people who've been doing solo arts longer than you have. And that's something I came into the scene with where anyone who has had been doing comedy longer than that's why in this podcast I mostly mess with people who either I think are just, my friends and they're funny. I think it'll be a fun a fun show. But mostly, you know, it was a great it was a great thing to get Ty on the show just because he has so much experience. Yeah, and he brought with him an entire an you, you could feel it when you're hanging out with them. I mean, he showed up like a professional, and he I, is. I had to step up my game. To I, I tried to make sure that I was extra sharp just so I didn't annoy him in a, like a professional way. And it, like, yeah, he's he's uh, opinionated and moody and this that and the other, but. Bottom line is that he's a, he's a murderous comedian. He's got his own social media. He's good at what he does, and he the talks a lot. Reputation speaks for itself. And he talks a lot of shit, but he's not a liar. You know, he can he's be. He's not very a liar. Mean. He's smart. Yeah. Um. Again, the reputation. He's smart. He has been around for so long, and a lot of people. You guys can say what you want, but again, it's like he says a lot of things, but he's he's somebody that lays it all out, and he is very. Um, 
constructed in the things that he says and he's not lying about it. They're always thought out. And, and you guys, yeah, it's always very thought yeah. out and you guys may hate what he's saying, but it's all truthful. I, you know what I mean? It's like, you say what you want, but it's all truthful. And, um, and those of you that are watching this know that Ty and I got into it earlier this year because a compulsive liar in the scene decided to chop up a bunch of bullshit fucking emails and put a rift between our friendship. And, um, it caused a little bit of a rift, but you know what the thing is, is like Ty and I are friends. We've been friends for 13 years. We're going to continue to be friends and we mended our friendship and everything's back to normal and it's fine. And I don't know why you guys just love drama so much that you continue to listen to this compulsive fucking lie. I, I can still tell you why, because they the don't have, because they don't have their own stuff going on. So they glob onto people who have more experience yeah. instead of learning from it. They, they try to, they try it's to like tailor this whatever. This guy has been proven as a, being a compulsive liar over and over and over again. And then, then he tells another lie, and then people believe him. He's actually ruined other friendships that I had with other female comics. And I'm like, why are you still listening to a compulsive fucking liar? I'm like, this guy's been in the scene for less than two fucking years. And he's not a comic. He, you know what I mean? It's like, he's just poison on the fucking scene. It's like, and, and it's like, and he has his own problems. Everybody has their own fucking problems that they need to deal with. You know what I mean? It's like... So, but you know what I mean? It's like, but again, it's like, I don't know. I don't even want to go down that route talking about that person. This is what I think. This is what I think. I think that there should be, I think that the really big scenes, there's a whole, all the, all the, it is a whole shitload of Tyra Veras. You know what I mean? I like we have like one, he comes up on every podcast. People talk about him. People make entire podcasts, like just blah, blah, blah. Whether you... But the point is that this is a this is a, a real professional in comedy. He's a mover and a shaker. He's been doing it long enough. He knows what he's doing, and and people gravitate towards that because I think there's if not if it's not an envy thing, it's like a it's like a it's like we have a black belt in a room full of white belts. You know what I mean? And and or you can go to a, a serious gym or treat your gym like a serious gym where you understand. Okay, like I'm you know white belt blue belt something like that but if there's a black belt in the room shut up and and they they're going to do stuff different than you they're going to say stuff different it's going to be different but because he's the only like he's not the only one but he's probably the most outspoken like really seasoned pro out here and so he gets a lot of attention for that but he also is still genuinely trying to help the scene by interacting yeah. at all the fact that he's showing up to class so to speak to hang out with a bunch of white belts like his whole beef with Delilah I think uh, you know, people can say, oh, they the get into the nitty gritty, the details of it. The thing is that he had her, a, a very green person who he was going to have run an open mic. Yeah. You know, and. Well, he was trying to go to bat for her. I was trying to go to bat for her. And you know what? what? It's like I kept trying to defend her with so many people. Um, and just I, numerous occasions, I was like, give her, you know, please don't discount her. I was like, she's a good person. I was like, she's going to see a neurologist. And she even told me, she's like, Angie, I'm going to see a neurologist. She's like, I know I have something wrong with my brain. I don't know if anything ever happened because she listened to that compulsive liar we were just talking about. And yeah, she's no longer my friend. And you know what? I wish nothing but the best for her because I prefer to stay on a higher vibration. And speaking of that kind of stuff, when someone like Ty Rivera walks into a room talking about like comedy and stuff like that because I'm like a really big into energy and stuff like that like I'm into spirituality and like I'm into rocks and tarot cards anybody that knows me I'm in all that kind of stuff talk all the shit you guys want um but here's the thing you feel someone's energy when they walk in the room and they don't even have to speak totally because you can tell that like a fucking master just walked into the room you know what I mean like and like people tell me that and I'm like I'm so humble about stuff. I'm like, thank you. But I just feel like I'm just like, I was talking about that today when Evan came over to get the Viagra from me for the naked, <laughs> for the naked roast battle. And, by the way, Evan we, came we, over to get a Viagra from me for the uh, naked roast battle. Skank fest is but I was this telling weekend. him, I was like, you know, I was just like, you know, it's like, I am just trying to be better than I was yesterday. I'm only in competition with myself. I am not trying to, you know, puff my chest out at any of you. I am not trying to be better than any of you. I'm not trying to judge anybody. And if I ever pass judgment on somebody, it's because they fucking finally deserved it. 
They're doing a nude roast battle at Skank Fest coming up. Shout out to Big yes. J and uh, Louis J. Gomez <laughs> so and Dave Smith. I go. I'm so Fuck. excited. And they yeah, because you look good up there. They're yeah. they're bringing out, but like this is this so. is a strategy just to shift gears. I give you a Viagra. They. <laughs> They, I have Viagra if anybody wants some. 20 bucks a pop. 20 bucks for Viagra if you want to do the naked roast battle. The, the, wh- how many people are going to have that idea? There's going to be a bunch of dudes with boners Okay, on so stage. I gave Evan the idea, and so he came and got a Viagra for me today. And then I had one other person reach out to me, which actually, let me check my text messages. That's this might be saying. one of them. This is not, the, like, so they Evan's must not the only wind. one who has that idea. That's I such guarantee an intense it. move. To, no, so one other person messaged me. <laughs> You either get no. up there and people find it funny, and, or and you're hard have, and everyone's grossed and out. And he's going to have a boner for a while after he gets off stage. <laughs> oh no, I had to give I had to give him the whole like today when he got to my house, I said, "Have you ever taken Viagra before?" And he goes, "No." And I go, "Okay." Oh boy. Oh well, let me give you the instructions on this, young man. I was all first off, split it in half. Fifty milligrams will do this. The you know, but the full thing, a hundred milligrams. Now whether you're drinking this and this, and if you're not drinking this, this, this. I was like, now just for the roast battle, I was like, you might want to just shave a little piece off. And this, this, this. I was like, but I was like, it's you know. So I gave him all the instructions on it because I've been. You, have to, you have to take Viagra to ride this ride. That. That's I'm what I'm so saying. Sad, I'm not going to be able to make it to the show. It sounds well. Like somebody so. reached out to me and they go, "We heard that you might be interested in doing the naked roast battle." And I said, "No." I was like, "Do you want to see a tampon string?" Oh, God. Uh, <laughs> I'm yeah. sorry. I'm that par- could be funny. They call it. Okay, I, I think if they- Evan's got a boner, you can have a tampon. That's yeah. only fair. I would have a butt yeah, plug. That's in true. If I was yeah, that's true. This got like a raccoon tail on it. <laughs> yeah, oh my God! A furry. <laughs> oh, is that a thing? Yeah, you haven't seen oh, that? Yeah. No! Are you kidding? You used to work in a swingers club. I don't want anything to do with you, you ass stuff, so I have no idea furries. about that. Of course, of course people are putting tails on their butt plugs. You didn't know that? That's How else do you get a tail? You yeah. got it in your butt. I just thought it had like a handle on it, so it... Well, the tail is the handle. That's how you get... See, I'm not into anything out. anything anal. So, yeah, that is so brother, fucking foreign to me. Well, you don't have a dick, but you know everything about Viagra. You sound like a pharmaceutical... Yeah, because I'm, I'm all about everything that goes in the front. Yeah. <laughs> Cover the whole spectrum. Skankfest is coming. Our friends are going to be naked <laughs> on stage doing roast battles. And I was explaining this to... Uh, who was I talking to about? I was We and Casper were talking last night about... Uh, by the way, come tomorrow and watch Casper and me host... The pa- the uh, not the paprika. What are we doing? It's the uh, there it is. The ghost pepper comedy open mic. We're taking over the Ocha show. Uh, I think it's going to be wild. We have the ghost pepper challenge, which we're going to be doing. You're going to get randomly drawn, and unless you opted out, you eat a ghost pepper, and then you do your set. Uh, just to mix things up, I'll be at the piano as always doing the MC deal. So come down to Ocha Mike. Uh, on tonight, tonight, Thursday. You guys should do a Thursday. peanuts. You guys should do a peanuts theme show since you're Charlie Brown. Oh, wait a second. Is it Linus playing the piano? Uh, Linus has the blanket, and so is it tr- uh, who plays the piano? Uh, it's it's um, isn't that isn't that Sally's brother? I forget. It's a it's just a separate kid. That his thing is he plays the piano. That's one of them plays the piano. Yeah. So yeah, you guys should do like a peanuts theme night. So like you play the piano. We should make. <laughs> We I should learned make, the, we I should learned make the, Casper be Pigpen. <laughs> Wouldn't that be so funny? Is that a Charlie Brown reference? Yeah, yeah. Pe- Pigpen Pe- Pe- Peanuts the, is Charlie Brown. The one who Peanuts. Always doing that, right? So I think I'm pretty sure Charlie Brown is the one that plays the piano. No, Charlie Brown's the no, main he's character. Not. He's got the zigzag on his shirt. He's yeah. The main, char- it is it, the main character is Charlie Brown and Linus. They're best friends. Linus always has a safety blanket. And then Linus's sister is Sally, who's the blonde girl. And then there's um, no fucking internet connection. Yeah, I was the gonna find out. Great. I'm gonna have to get it. All right, I'm calling Cox as soon as you guys get out of here. But yeah, that's anyway. I did learn the peanuts theme on the on the uh, piano. That was one of the first things I learned because oh, I love nice. it. I love that song. It's one of the coolest little piano ditties. Say penis theme. Yeah, it that's the like penis it. theme. The theme to penis. No peanuts. Peanuts. Theme. Peanuts. Okay. Yep. And uh, it, it's uh, you know it's just a cool piano song. Anyway. Uh, we have a lot of fun stuff we're going to be doing at Ocho, but uh, hope, mainly we just want to rebrand. And a, a lot of the people that that Ty scared off are going to come back. Not that you know, I mean, because Ty was very uh, vocal. He sort of treated it like a kill Tony situation, right? Where you have open micers, but then if you're bombing after two minutes, he'll just start talking on the mic and, and essentially give you a, a very harsh comedy lesson right there. But if, if you have written material that is even remotely interesting, I'll let you go. So but, one thing I will say is when I ran my open mics, um, 
But that's not what I'm saying is that like, I don't know if it's going to be necessarily a good thing if some of those people start coming back because a lot of those people, they got chased out. They weren't really contributing to the show. You know, they, they weren't, it's not like they're killing on stage and yeah. they got chased away. You know what I mean? Well, okay. So when I ran my open like, mics, this is what I would do. It's like I would set out a sign-up sheet and people would sign up, but I would say, hey, look, I'm like, where you sign up is not where you're going up. And if I didn't already know you, I'd say, okay, how long have you been doing stand-up? Do you have a show you're prepping for? If I didn't know you, are you here from out of town? You know, whatever, whatever. Because back then, we everybody fucking knew each other because there was not very many comics here in town. Anyway, so I would always do this with the level of talent. So I'd have like two or three killers go up at the front. And then from there, I'd have somebody shit the bed. Yeah. <laughs> somebody that wasn't very good, yeah, you know. Layer it. And then, yeah, I'd have to layer it, you know, because we'd have, we usually had an audience. So this would keep the asses in the seats. You I know? think that's how we're going to use the ghost pepper thing, where but, if, we, if we have someone. But like who, if we had somebody that was fairly new, that wasn't very good, it's like I would have them only do like two or three minutes. I wouldn't yeah. give them a full five. Right. So people either do two, three, five, or seven minutes. Yeah. But it would fit into a two-hour show. So you would really customize the open mic list to Absolutely. suit the talent level. So to make Absolutely. For the but if somebody said, hey, I have a show coming up, I would go, okay. So I would, again, customize it. Yeah. Yeah. That's really probably the best way to do it. It's a little micromanagement, right? But it sounds like it would ultimately make a better show because really – if you've got th two or three stinkers in a row, a lot of people will leave the bar. They'll just go somewhere else. It's not like there's only one place to drink. And if you're at a terrible show, it just has to be entertaining. That's Well, I the think thing is, is we did it just letting people go up wherever they signed up. Yeah, right. And it got to the point where we never had a fucking audience because when we did have an audience, we'd have three, four, or five in a row that shit the bed. The audience would leave and then all the good ones would go up, but we'd have no audience. And then I finally said, you know what? Fuck this. I'm going to start moving around. Again, it ran two nights a week for six fucking years. So eventually I developed a format that worked really, really well. That's what it is. is practice makes perfect. And you yeah. have, but you also have to be focused on the right parameters. I mean, it really is just butts in the seats. How many non-comics do you have? Can you promote in a way that attracts people who are just want to go see an open mic comedy? Because say, hey, do you want to go to an open mic comedy night? That's a hard maybe. You know what I mean? If you don't know the scene, that's a hard maybe because you don't know what it's going to be, especially in Vegas, because some of them are really, you know, you're dealing with, you know, 10 comics and nobody else. And other ones you might be dealing with, it might be like a wise guys where you have a whole bunch of real audience members that want to see comedy. They understand that not everybody is really experienced, but they also might run into some killers. You know, I've seen some amazing three minute sets of wise guys from some real professionals. Talk about, uh, at like um, I don't know, like Carlos Anthony, man. Talk about a, a, a dude who has gotten. Re I mean, he started opening up for um, 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 what's his name? Help me out. He's playing. He's got. He's the resident at the uh, you know undercover brother. Um, I don't know shit about Vegas. I'm why can't I think here. of it? No, when I came back Carlos two years Anthony's ago, fucking it. part time famous. You guys check yeah, him out. Yeah. Um, no, I like I know Carlos okay enough, and I think he's hilarious. But I don't know that much about him. But I think he is a definite hilarious guy. I think that he is a um, class act human being. He is. Yeah. And I think that uh, on and off stage, that he is just an amazing person he absolutely, but i don't know that much about him he absolutely murdered at 18 ben on tuesday it was just I'm you know we left because and... i wanted him to go see artifice so right before bruce finished we left so he could go see artifice because i wanted him to get a feel of right. what tuesday nights were in vegas so yeah we didn't get to see carlos yeah, yeah. we should have stayed at 18 ben the other place was cool but the other show was way more hopping yeah it was it was happening more on tuesday night yeah, well, that, that restaurant is pretty popular anyway. I think a lot of people just go there anyway. They have food, which makes a big difference from Artifice as yeah, well. Yeah, Artifice and needs then, to have food. And, and also, Amir has done so much work at the LA Comedy Club and so on. I think that, you know. It makes it, a big draw. It yeah. does. And Amir just, because I know Amir from LA. And Amir out in LA, it's almost like, uh, here's my philosophy about LA comics. Um, and this goes back to those fucking booked open mics. 90% of the people that pick up a mic in LA have no business doing it because there's so many shitty fucking comics in the LA metropolis. But the other 10% that pick up a microphone are wildly fucking talented, wildly talented. And um, it takes a while sometimes for them to weed through all the bullshit because all those pieces of shit sucky comics that have blown so much smoke up their ass 
keep fucking taking away stage time from the really talented people. So, um, but uh, it's like, so Amir was one of those. So when Amir moved here, he finally started getting noticed for how talented he truly is because Amir is so fucking good. That's a real plus of the Las Vegas scene too, is that it really when you is. do have it guys is. like, like um, one of my favorite uh, guys who came in post pandemic and now he's back in New York is is Jordan Perry. Yeah, yeah, like, I love Jordan. He's, he's such a good person. Well, he's, he's really he's, comic. Well, he's really he's really talented. Like he always takes things to uh, like as, as far as and like, he really got to spread his wings here. Yeah, I he, know him from LA too. And he's one of those guys where he walks in the room and you're like, this guy knows what he's doing, and you really feel that yeah. from him. Yeah. We have a lot of really talented people. Not a lot of them are as active as on social media. And uh, there's not I'm really, not. <laughs> there's not really any podcasts. That's the thing too. Is that I want to build this one into where it's like, hey, if you're a comedian coming into town, come through. I don't care who you like or don't like. I want to talk, and you, you say your piece here, and then people watch it. If you follow comedy in Vegas, and then if you disagree, come on and say your piece. You should put together some type of like a small like uh, <coughs> thirty second uh, sizzle reel, maybe. <coughs> Um, yeah. Something really fun, and then um, just like a little, you know, advertisement, whatever. That's what and, I've been doing. Uh, is every day, I'm getting. I'll share up. it. He'll share it. You know, yeah, Ty'll yeah. share it. You know what I mean? It's like, and then that way, out of towners can start setting up a schedule with you, saying, "Hey, I'm going to be coming through town," and uh, even if you have to do it. It sucks, like like with COVID, we had to do it like through our phones and stuff like that. So silly. Because um, we prefer to that. do it in yeah. person. That was something that Yoshi and I talk about. It's like we prefer to do a podcast like this because it just becomes more fun when we're doing it in person like this. Well, that's know? where you're going to get real interaction and likes, which is another reason it's very important to perform at real shows where you have audience members. I compare it to like a dueling piano bar yeah. or a karaoke bar. Are you that good on a piano? Uh, Could you be a dueling pianist? Not Well, I don't know. I know a lot of pop songs. I just don't play them that much because at Ocha it's usually theme songs or sound effects and stuff. I'll, you know, I'll play TV show theme songs or it's just a tiny piece. Uh -huh. It keeps my attention span. So I really just focus on how do I contribute to the laughs per minute aspect of the show by playing a quick thing here, a quick thing there. It doesn't take much time for people to get up from the audience to the stage. And so uh, I don't play too much of any one song. But uh, I mean the dueling piano in the sense that that format of show, the audience is absolutely necessary for the show to be good. You have to, you don't have to be the best piano player or the best singer. You just have to do the song well enough that the audience can sing along. Once they're singing along, you got them and they're having fun. Yeah. And, and comedy is the same way where if you can't, uh, you don't necessarily have to be a crowd work person, but you have to connect with the audience in order to make them laugh because the same jokes you play in room A may not work in room B, and the reason is you. You have yeah. to learn how to pivot and adjust. And I think a lot of people don't quite get that, but I think that's an experience thing. And one detail, Absolutely. That, one detail that I found uh, that a lot of people that are doing really well that started out at the same time as me, uh, you take you are is that they've gone and played out of state and then they come back and all of a sudden now they have that real world experience and the confidence to know that their shit works elsewhere where it's not a crowd full of jaded comedians. That's what I'm getting with this experience, which is really nice. Well, yeah, you're going to go back to Missoula and you're going to have a whole different attitude. You're going to be calibrated differently because you yeah. know you know what's out there and anybody can do it out here. You guys should move down here. I would be, but you with guys, your girlfriend's profession, I would, you guys should move down here. Definitely painted a very pretty picture for the Is she a stripper? Because I know she is. Yeah. Yeah. Is I know the owner's owner sapphire. I can help you uh, well, get her a job. I, I don't know why you're in, unless like Big Fish Little Pond. I mean, you could you could be regular sized fish in the, the yeah. ocean. You know what I mean? I think she's definitely talked about that, like at least trying it out, coming down. But Vegas, as far as strippers go, is like I've never seen, because there's a lot of like stigma that comes with strippers and that they're like, you know, they're kind of, you got to be sort of screwed up to do that job, et cetera. And that is kind of true if you go to like Bourbon Street, if you go to like, you know, I love Portland. New Orleans. Oh. I do too. I'm, I'm from there. Like my family's from there. I spend a lot. Of, when I fly home, I go to Louis Are Armstrong. Are you a good cook? I can cook all right. Um, you I can't cook fucking Cajun food? No, I don't really cook like, like, uh, you ever Cajun seen that stuff. movie where like the ant burns the food? And she's like, it's Cajun. And he's like, if this is oh. Cajun. <laughs> you ever seen that? <laughs> no, they just mess it up and say it's Cajun. Yeah. yeah. It's a good room. Yeah. <laughs> he goes, if this is Cajun, I'm Caucasian. He goes, this food is awful. <laughs> my, my, what I was getting to nice. with the strippers around that out is just that the strippers here, are, there's a lot more money and business oriented. 
You know, I used to have the joke that's like, how does UNLV even stay in business? Because every job you would get to pay your way through college pays way more money than you would to actually. You'd be a valet. If you're, if you're a union bartender here, you're making doctor money. No, that's the thing. It's like, so yeah. So I have a girlfriend that when I first moved here 21, 22 years ago, she just was a regular, like, um, she was on like the extra board bartender. Now she manages like a PTs for those locals here in Vegas. You know what PTs are. And she makes, um, because of our gamblers, she makes doctor money. I mean, she makes over a hundred thousand a year, and I think she probably makes maybe close to two hundred thousand dollars a year. Yeah, just yeah. managing. Well, PTs is like one of the biggest chains, well, the it's, biggest bar chain. For and it's not bars just managing a PTs when you have people come in and gamble. Say that they hit eight grand on a fucking royal flush or something like that. Yeah, well, you know they still you say, some. you know, tip ten twenty percent. And she's like, Angie, if I have three or four people hit that in a day, and a lot of times that's your clientele. Those are your regulars. They only come in and gamble on your shift. Right. So if she has three or four of those a day, she's like, you wouldn't believe how much I take home in tips certain days. So yeah, she'll make like $200,000 a year. Like she owns a gigantic house. She owns a couple of different cars. They're both Mercedes. You know, like... The yeah. strippers do pretty well here too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, the, the, twenty-four this, hours a day. This is where the strip clubs. When I when I worked at Rick's Cabaret when they first opened, because as a fighter, you want to work in a bar because you can make bar money, but then you don't want to go through all the bureaucracy of a casino if you just moved here. It's tricky. So I worked at a place where um, they the I I worked at a strip. So strip clubs are a place where if you're working in like industry, you can you can just go get a job if you know somebody and. <clears throat> The girls here, a lot of them that dance, they're, they're like, I was just said they're business strippers. Because a lot of these girls, they will just go live in Miami. They'll fly out for a couple of months a year and make no, as some, much money yeah. as they want. And then they just go back and, you know, just hang out as a hot girl in L.A. or Miami or wherever they live, you yeah, know. Was, and then they just come out here to do a few, a little while. It's like the, the I, I met a porn star who did that in L.A. where he lived here because it was cheap. And then he would fly out for like one month. He'd work like three weeks and then he would come back. He'd basically be like a touring comedian. It's like, he's going to yeah. fly over here, work for a night and come back. Yeah, it's just like correspondent. You're just, you're just making crazy money through correspondence. Vegas is just a very different vibe when it yeah. comes to any kind of entertainment industry, even if it's uh, sex work or whatever. Right. Um, I had some friends that uh, used to work at Seamless. For those of you that know back in the day, Seamless. That's After club. Hours Club, yeah. And well, no, it was a strip club, and then it had the the DJs that would do after hours. Okay, yeah. So, but when that place opened, that was the best, the hottest strip club in fucking town. It was right across the street from Orleans, um, and uh, so yeah, I had a bunch of friends that worked there that weren't dancers. They um, worked like you had to check the girls' sheriff cards when they came in, and then I had some friends that worked the the main door when you came in. Anyways, but they said some of the girls that work there. They made so much money. What they did is they actually lived down in like Cabo and stuff like that. But what they did is they went down and had a house built cash, like mansions, like living like fucking celebrities. Yeah. And um, yeah, because it's like, you know, our money goes so far in Mexico. So they'd go live down there for like a month, two months. They'd come up here and work like a week, two weeks. And then they'd go home for like two months. And then they'd come back up here yeah. and work for a week, two weeks. But yeah, I mean that's the kind of money that your yeah. girlfriend could make. So and she makes great money in Missoula because there's only one strip club there, the Fox Club. Yeah, but but right. imagine that it, like but... <clears throat> let's see a picture of her. Sorry, babe. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's come on, it. let's show her. Let's show her on camera. What's her name? Uh, I don't think she'd like me to disclose that. <laughs> Rain oh, yeah. is her stage name. Okay, I was going to say, what's her stripper name? Rain? <laughs> Rain. Okay, so let's see a picture. You don't have to put it on the camera. Just At let Rain. Dave and I see it. At Rain backslash OnlyFans. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, well, there's one of those pictures. Okay. Uh, those aren't good ones. <laughs> yeah, let's just see how she looks normally. Let me see. I'm trying to find one. And right. the fact that she's your baby mama, I mean, like, because I didn't know that that was your, you know, I didn't know that was your baby's mom or whatever, but, um, so we used to do, um, uh, yeah, I, I'm realizing I'm very bad at taking pictures of my spouse. Then show us a picture of like when she's got her fucking hair and makeup done. Where's her goddamn Instagram? I don't think she really has one. She doesn't keep up on it. Let me find Let it. Me you got a social network. Is that her? Even strippers got on a social backdrop? network. On your backdrop, is that her? Now. It's oh, all yeah. marketing. If you're if you're in a if you're a one man show yeah. performer of any kind, you know, then, then yeah. So you, I mean, there you she is on the backdrop. Media. Yeah, she's pretty lady. Yeah, she's pretty. She's yeah. banging. She's a pog. 
She's got it What's going a on. A, a pretty ass white girl. Perfect ass white, perfect girl. ass white perfect girl. Perfect ass white girl. That's the category. Yeah, yeah. I had to Google oh, it's it too. Oh, P A W G. Yeah. P A W G. Yeah. Lovely. Yeah, she yep. kills it. It's like it's a the, great mom. the old Michael Jackson song, P Y T. Yep, very different acronym, I'm sure. I don't know. I don't you guys know. remember that song? What does the P stand for for the Michael Jackson song? The P Y T, Pretty Young Thing. Oh, thank God. I want God. to love you, Pretty Young <laughs> Thing. <laughs> but yeah, uh, being with a dancer, it's given me a lot of respect for them because they deal with a lot of shit. They're basically like sexy therapists. So down yeah. here, she will make a lot more money. Yeah, yeah. the two rules you got to hold your drink. You gotta hold your alcohol and hold a conversation. If you can do yeah. that, you make a lot of money right. here. It's about having, you know, your own personal boundaries. But the girls are really experienced. They can walk in. They they will be in the back of the room. They'll see a guy walk in. They can see his watch from across the room, and they're like, "I'm gonna make a thousand dollars." Just did it again. Are you trying to sign in? Our bandwidth is up. I don't know. There's something going on with my phone. How about no? You can't sign in. We'll be right back, folks. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, we're yeah. still go- we're still going, but. Um, Oh, no, don't allow. Fuck off. All right, we're doing this one. We got to wrap in a little bit anyway. But, uh, do do do. Pay no attention to the curtain. Does everybody like the tablecloths behind us? It's not tablecloths, they're very professional Hollywood. Uh, <laughs> yeah, let me the same curtains they use in The Wizard of Oz. How dare you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Judy Garland threw up on that. It's rude. Have some respect. That alarm for... just went off at 6 p.m. Should we yeah. dismiss it? Is that my alarm? No, oh, that's what I get for sending away the alarm. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God, my fucking phone. All right. Um, well, yeah, we have been, we have been going. We, we didn't get into... Uh, what did we not get into we can talk about There's next There's a lot time. of stuff that we didn't get no into answer. because, honestly, it's like we had to restart it so many times. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you want, we can keep doing more episodes. I mean, this was a nice little, like... Um, yeah, a little test run. This is a nice little... Um, what is it? Training wheels for you. Yeah. Sorry, I've been so quiet. I'm I usually don't my, have this. my feet. No, I, I tend to dominate things. So I I'm usually don't. I that. usually don't have this many technical difficulties. I thought I had had it figured you out. You know what? It's the because it I'm crashed. here because I I uh, steal I steal electricity. I know you're sucking up all our bandwidth. <laughs> no, I do. I do. I've I've been told that before. Okay. Yeah, I've been told that before. Was that from your your crystals? Did they tell you that? No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, I just uh, something about me just uh, takes away energy. You're a powerful lady. You're I, very it's, difficult it's, to ignore. It's, it's not from people. It's just from uh, electricity, and then people take my energy. Do you have that thing where you're driving and traffic lights turn off right before you, right when you pass by them? Yeah, that's weird. All the time. Crazy. Yeah, me too. Uh, but I just figured that that was normal. You, you try to, to use your vibrator, and it's the it's already out of batteries. Well, no, I do that every day, but that's just my sex drive. She's got a generator in her bedroom. Yeah. <laughs> no, I switch back to regular batteries it's because diesel. Yeah. I switch back to regular batteries because stuff that's rechargeable sucks because it's like right when you're getting ready to come, the fucking thing dies. Yeah. I don't have that problem. Yeah, well, you're a dude. I have that problem with this podcast sometimes. <laughs> Uh, so well, let's see. All right, um, I guess we can go ahead and um, we can wrap it up. I'm sorry if this one was kind of boring. It's not as uh, fun and crazy and controversial as your last one, but we're gonna have to do yeah. another one. Yeah, we're gonna have. Uh, if you ever want me to come on and co-host with you with somebody, that would be fun. I, yeah, I love co co-hosting. You know what? Having a co-host. When I had my podcast, I always had a co-host on yeah. it, and that was always really fun. But it was never the same one. Yeah, I, I like I like that idea as well as having somebody who's just a, a di- just a different vibration, but to if if I slow like right now, someone boom jump in, so I'm gonna see the opportunity to pop in. But it's not it's always better when I have multiple people, and when uh, we got our internet going, we have we we I can really run it like a TV show. Like you'll see you'll see on the live stream tonight from Ocha. We'll, we have, we'll have a strong stream probably the entire show because when we, we hooked up like three cameras uh, when we were out there and test ran the whole thing and it worked fantastic. I'm going to call the cable company and try and increase yeah, the bandwidth Cox here. Yeah, call and just yeah. get the highest internet that you have here. Yeah, 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 for yeah. sure. Because, I mean, this, this show is like, it's not only am I enjoying it, but I've been getting a lot of positive feedback. And what you're talking about making a montage or like a, a, a highlight reel. You know, I've been cutting out. I've been going in Especially, every day, taking one-minute clips from just random old episodes that I've done and throwing them up on social media. And I've been organically beginning to generate a couple of subscribers every day that way, which has been nice. positive. Well, so and also it's like it. doing that, like I said, it's like if you could um, do like I was telling you earlier about like 
reaching out to people far enough in advance um, when you see they're coming into town. Like, that's really going to help a lot because yeah. some of them, even though they might have a really big name, like, okay, for instance, like, David Tell is going to be here at Skankfest this weekend. Um, I love David Tell. The first time I met him was, oh, my God. It was probably 12 years ago. And this is back, um, like, when I was talking about names back in the day, so shortly after I started Meatheads, other names that came along were like Kevin Winnie. Um, he was one of the names that came along. Bruce Purcell. He had just moved to town. You know, those were other names. So anyways, um, but Kevin, me, him, Robbie Comers, and Jeremy Wean, we went to L.A. and um, we met Dave Attell at the Comedy Store. And he was like, oh, do they have any type of local scene out there? And I was like, yeah, I go, I run um, Tuesdays and Thursdays. Well, Kevin started running an open mic on Wednesdays. And um, then he started running a showcase on Saturdays. And this is way after I stopped the, the power exchange stuff. Because that only went on for a short amount of time. Because it really was only You can only have so much longevity with a show if people are getting fisted in the With a fucking swingers audience. club. Like, people loved the idea of going to a show at a swingers club. But they didn't want to see anything else that went on at the swingers club. And that's what we discovered. And it didn't go on for very long. Anyways, so... Um, but yeah, so I did Tuesdays and Thursdays. Kevin had Wednesdays. And then I did Friday nights at the bunkhouse. And Kevin had Saturday nights at MVPs. That was on Trop and Jones. It's some weird restaurant now. Anyways, but that went on for a long time, too. So it was a great setup. Anyways, so um, there's your alarm again. You're snoozing it. Hit dismiss on that side. Okay. Shut up. So anyways, we meet Dave Attell at the comedy store. And we're like, oh, yeah, we have these open mics on these nights, blah, blah, blah. So after that, you know, we come back here, whatever. Four years later, I had moved to L.A. I was living there. I saw Dave Attell again at the uh, Hollywood Improv. And I was just like, oh, hi, you know, my name's Angie. And he goes, I met you before. He goes, you're the one that runs rooms in Vegas. Cool. And I was like, oh, my God, I can't believe you remember yeah, me. And I looked dope. completely different than when he met me the first time. Like, my hair was different. You know what I mean? Like, everything about me was different. I had lost some weight, you know. And, um, and he sat there and he just shot the shit with me for a while. It was just me and him talking. Yeah. And it was so cool. And I was like, what a fucking class act of a human being. So when people ask me about the celebrities that I've met, I was like, David Tell, hands down, the coolest celebrity that I have ever met. I've only ever heard good things about David Tell. Yeah. He's one of the yeah. greatest. And Yoshi is friends with him. And Yoshi's a really good friend of mine. And he said, if Dave is ever running a show in L.A., he goes, and you're there. He goes, go in and tell him you're a friend of mine. He goes, and Dave will probably give you stage time. Yo, so remember that. that. So Just cool. Yeah. Mention Yoshi's name and you'll get stage time no. with David Tell. <laughs> because he's going to fact check it. He'll probably be like, hey, uh, this chick Angie Crum is asking for stage time. And Yoshi will be like, oh, yeah. That's my that's my bud right there. I mean, Yoshi stays in my house every time he's in town, you know, me and a couple other people. So Yoshi is a really interesting character. I can't wait to get him in here. <clears throat> yeah, next time Yoshi's in, in town, um, he's going to come do the podcast with me. So the awesome. next the yeah. second time. Yeah, Angie, anytime you got somebody from out of town, like I, you, you're a great bridge for me to go from. I know, you know everybody. That's the thing. Everybody's like, Angie knows everybody. I yeah. know everybody for the most part. You guys, I have been doing this shit for so long and I am the. There's so many comics that go, I wish I had your networking skills. I'm like, just walk up and talk to people. Just walk up and talk to people. Because the thing that you're going to realize is they are just as insecure as you are to talk to people. It's funny how so many of you guys can do this on stage. But when you get off stage, you guys are, no. Yeah. Talk to people off stage. Just walk up. Just walk up to a complete stranger. I mean, because this is something that broke me of that. When I was in high school, I was the shyest person you would have ever met. I got into beauty school and it broke that. And I think that's something that helped my comedy career. Um, but yeah, it's like, so again, the people are like, I wish I had your networking skills. But again, it's like, I know fucking everybody just because I walked up and said, hey, you know what I mean? It's like, it's just that fucking simple. Yeah. That's how she got it's me opened, here. It's opened so many doors, you know? Yeah, no, yeah, that's yeah. how I got you here because I was emceeing the show and I had to talk to you. Yeah, yeah how did true. you guys meet? Okay, so... Uh, what was it? The beginning of September, so a little over a month ago, um, I was up doing a suicide prevention show that we've been doing for three years now. That was just our third one. We made it a two-nighter this time. And um, so the second night, Nick Kynette, that's moving down here from Kalispell, 
shout out to Nick Kynette, High Country Living on um, Instagram. He was down here and he was like, so we were doing, actually one of the nights was his going away party where we still did uh, the suicide prevention raffles and everything like that and they raised a shit ton of money. Um, so he was like, hey, this kid Blake Powell is gonna come out and do a guest spot on the Saturday night show. He said, every time I've seen him perform, he said he kills every time. He goes, actually one night I had him do a guest spot. He goes, and the headliner sucked and only yeah, did like, was- the headliner, he's from Reno. We're not going to say his name. I met the guy once before, and I thought he sucked too. Not going to say his name. I would love to call him out because, hi, you do stand-up, but it's not comedy. There's so many people I would love to go down the list and fucking say that about. You're killing, you're ruining microphone time for so many fucking people. It worked out for So me, many though, of you, night. so many of you are ruining microphone time for people. Anyway, so. Yeah, headliner, he did like five minutes. And, and then, then like, yeah, you gotta get somebody back on stage. And so like, Nick was like, "Hey, can you get back up there?" And Blake was like, "Yeah, sure." Two years in, he just you what you've barely been doing it two years. So Blake got back up there and killed it again. So like wow. 10 minutes, all so. yeah, all Nick does is just boast and boast and boast about this kid. So thank you, Nick. when I was up there, yeah, thank you, Nick. So when I was up there like a month ago, um, Nick was like, "Okay, Blake is gonna come up on Saturday do a guest spot." So as I'm emceeing it. I was like, um, so I went up to him. I was like, hi, I'm Angie. Nice to meet you. How do you want me to, you know, intro you, whatever, whatever, all this other stuff. And so he got up there and he fucking killed it. He fucking crushed it. So I was like, you know, if you ever want to come down to Vegas, you know, we've been texting back and forth. I was like, if you ever want to come to Vegas, I can get you on a bunch of shows because it's rare that you see somebody only two years in that has this can, much can, talent can save like this a much show, talent like two years in where the yeah, ta- where the headliner impressive. shit the bed and a guest spot got back up there and it saved it feeling. where the headliner shit the bed <laughs> two the best years feelings in. of my career yeah yeah yes. yeah. But, yeah it worked out and that's how we met and and yeah. i even told him the other day i said i don't offer people to come crash at my house and you know and put my connections out there and say, hey, can you please give this person a guest spot? Hey, can I get you booked on, can I book him on this show? You know, I was like, I don't do that for everybody. I was like, but you fucking killed it. Nick gave you so many great reviews. I was like, so come down. It's like, and this is just kind of like, you're slowly bleeding into the Vegas scene. I was like, so now the next time you come down, you will be getting paid for yeah. stuff. You it know? was a good test run. Yeah. You've, enjoyed, you've been very gracious, a good host, connecting me with people. You're so fucking nice. Thank you, Angie. I know I am. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> and, you can, and you cut hair. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You got. I got to get a haircut. You're going to do my hair next, right? Yeah, I'm back yeah. in the salon on Wednesday. Um, maybe I'll cut your hair in the morning before you fly yeah. out. I still yeah, think you should smaller. change your flight. I should, but, you know, I got the kid who misses me and bo- all that bullshit, you know. Yeah, but you know what? If you can make connections this weekend that will help your career, that's just going to help your life. Yeah, fuck my kid. <laughs> no, I'm not saying fuck your kid, but I'm just saying it's like you're so talented. What if you meet people this weekend? Like, what if for I some know. wild reason you meet one of these fucking star comics and say, you know what? I want to start taking you on tour with me. This is a really good weekend yeah. to be here because we had the comedy festival. We had all these people from out of town, and then we have Skank Fest. We're going to have all these people from out of town, big names, small names. Uh, it's uh, it's going to be a time when everyone is going to be hitting open mics. The open mics have been actually pretty busy in the last couple of weeks because we have had all these comedy yeah. events going on so i mean it is it is but then also that happens several times a year here mm-hmm. as well we have like convention season and stuff so it's a great place that's why i'm pretty optimistic about this podcast being able to climb up to a certain level because it is like a it's a networking city it's all you know the best way to get a job is you don't fill an application turn in you got to know some people talk to some right. people do the bare minimum of paperwork and then you start working like right away yeah that's, so how, that's how it should want to do all that but it definitely there's like a line a balance it's like i don't want to bite off more than i can chew at the yeah, level i'm at you know? so, that's totally fine but there's know? all like being you always hear like it takes at least ten years to find your voice, and it's like being yeah, two years in, it's like fuck that. I want to do it sooner. Since that's your baby but, mama, and she being a dancer, she's beautiful. She is gonna make probably four times the amount she makes now. Yeah, she already makes four times the amount I make. I don't get any say in anything. So I'm not gonna ask you to say it on the air right now, but again, she's gonna make four times the amount that she makes now. I mean, especially because it's a 24 hour town. Um, is it nude? Is it full nude up there or is it just topless? Yeah, they go full nude. Okay, so here, if she's working in a place that serves alcohol, she just has to go topless. 
But remember I was showing you yesterday the little darlings thing? Yeah. It's like, that's full nude, but there's no alcohol. Funniest billboards so, in Vegas, too. Yeah. They got a comic right now. Well, it's now. funny it's because, so funny. like, they um, have the best billboard. I saw the little darlings billboard on an Instagram post. Right. And I was like, oh, that was one day ago. I go, you know what? I go, when we're driving down there, I said, we have to drive right past there. And I showed him, I go, look, I go, there it is. I go, there it is. I go, that post is still up. You yeah, know, I was like, it's funny. still on their thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's like following a comedian on Twitter, looking at the driving on the 15, seeing the little darlings billboards. It's always something funny. I, yeah, I like their, what was the last one they said where they were just like uh, lap dances for a full tank of gas or something like yeah. that? <laughs> that they was do good. that at the strip like, club in <clears throat> Missoula. The, the sign, it's always really like derogatory I, terms. I, I, I love women. their their motto is like we have we have dozens of beautiful women and three ugly ones. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yeah. yeah. I can't remember. Well, during COVID, shit, yeah. they were doing uh, drive up lap dances. So you could just drive up, you open your car door, and they'd come out and give you a lap dance from the That's driver's wild. seat. I yeah. wrote jokes about that. <laughs> Whoever's whoever's running Little Dar- Darlings, that is a business survivor. They, they know how to pivot, they are committed to that life. Yeah. But, okay, so um, we're going to go ahead and round it up. i got to go uh, do my daddy duties. And um, it's been great having you guys in here. I really appreciate it. Uh, Angie coming in, the networking. I think this is the uh, beginning of a beautiful relationship where we're going to be able to uh, get so, get some get not only some bigger names, but just uh, network the podcast out. You know, and let yeah, people absolutely. Know. <clears throat> and I'm that's what I want to do. You know, I got to fix the internet thing so my tech can keep up with the the guests now because you know, imagine if my shit had crashed three times when Ty was on. You know what I mean? He would have been angry. He would have been like. Mr. Hewlett. Yeah, I mean, I'm friends with him. So he, like, you can fix this by going down on me. Uh, nah, Ty's never actually. <laughs> I know, I'm just fucking with you. Ty's never played gay chicken with me. He, ta- no, he talks a little I'm bit of shit. With he you. really fucks with Casper and like Alan and some of the other like hairless little twink dudes out there but <laughs> the ones you know he can dominate yeah well i mean that's that's part of his thing you know that's part of his shtick at the mic is he sexually harasses you know dudes. That's, that's all good fun you know it's all funny um but you know it's all comedy making jokes so uh networking uh be sure to come by the ghost pepper comedy open mic at ochatai it is now a with me and casper going to be rebranding it check out the episode where you eat the peppers so you get an idea what you're in for because it was as bad as we thought but it, it got the job done it got the job done it was a lot of fun <laughs> real quick something i want to throw in there like casper's like we don't have any other challenges or whatever and i was like okay so i will think of them I used to do a show for Rob Cole, the Balloon Master. Some of you know who it is, who he is. Some of you don't. Um, he did some of the funnest fucking comedy variety shows. Do you know who the Balloon Master is? No. Uh-huh. All right, yeah. He does human-sized balloon animals. Oh, my God. But they're X-rated. R-rated, okay. X-rated. Yeah, he's fucking awesome. Um, is that the, the pussy with feet picture? No, no. That was, that was just something that a client was sending me today. So, anyways... Um, so he would have me on his shows and they called me the bubblegum comic. Now, the first thing it made me do was take like a whole pack of like hubba bubba or whatever the fuck those bubblegum. You remember the big like chunks of bubblegum we used to eat or whatever? It tastes right. like medicine. I would have to eat a whole pack of those. So basically what they would do is you eat as much, like you chew as much bubblegum while you're trying to tell jokes. Okay. And then he would come by and if you could still understand what I was saying, he would walk by and throw three more pieces in my mouth. He doesn't and do anything like, here. <laughs> and I would still keep telling jokes. And if you could still understand what I was saying, he'd come by and he'd throw more in my mouth. So I think we got to like 37 pieces and then you finally got to the point where, yes, of course you don't fucking swallow it, but it's like you're just chewing all this gum Ugh. trying to tell jokes uh, but like he'd have things like like people would like you know slice samurai swords like on someone's stomach but like cut open a fucking watermelon and then right. he had the bearded lady on the show and like There's so he did all this crazy shit. variety shit but it's like yeah so I was the bubblegum comic so I mean all that's right. something kind of fun to do it's like so yeah it's like I, I, would, I finally got to the point where after 37 pieces of gum you could not understand my jokes anymore and you and you do comedy the puppetry the penis show as oh well, so right? I'm the I'm the second understudy so Understudy. Christine, so again, Christine, again, with you being a dick expert and not having a dick, this is fascinating. <laughs> yeah, so Christine Von Hagen is the main comic. So Puppetry of the Penis, um, they have a comic come out and warm the crowd up for 20 minutes before they introduce the dicks. So Christine Von Hagen's the main comic. So when she's either out of town or sick or whatever, she has Stephen Roberts uh, is her understudy. Well, when, right. when her and Stephen are either both busy or out of town, then that's when I come in. And I fucking love that job. 
Um, what, honestly, kind of crowd, what kind of crowd comes to puppetry of the penis? It is from all over the world. You never know what you're going to get. I mean, of course, they have to be of age. But, yeah, you never know what you're going to get. And, it, I mean, it's a, it's a really fun cake job. You get on stage at 8 o'clock. You're done by 8.20. After that, you can leave. The pay is really good. Um, and uh, you have no content restrictions. So, yeah, you do 20 minutes. You have a new crowd every night. They are from all over the world. Sometimes you have a bunch of uh, bachelors, bachelorettes. Sometimes you have couples. Sometimes you have a shit ton of women. Sometimes you have a bunch of gays. It's always different. It's always fun. I bounce new material off of them. I sculpt old material. It's always different. I fucking love that job. I would love to have a residency for any type of show like that. I am very jealous of Christine's job, but I am very happy for her at the same time. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so we'll end that. Uh, check out Puppetry the Penis. Check out the uh, Ghost Pepper mic tonight and Thursday at Ocha. And uh, check out Angie Crumb everywhere, including Puppetry the Penis all over. Do you still do L.A.? Are you not uh, yeah, while? I mean, I still go to L.A., but I mean, honestly, when they raised up the fucking gas prices, I drive a truck. There you go. I mean, to go back and forth to L.A., it cost me like $300, so done, fuck son. you, L.A. Yeah. Yeah, fuck yeah. that. And we have our friend visiting us, first podcast ever, first trip to Vegas doing comedy, right? Yeah. And uh, Bla yeah. Blake Powell. Just say one more thing before. Yeah. It's just I like shit on Missoula in the beginning, saying it's woke. It is a great town. Come check out the scene there. If you guys ever need other comedians that I'd say are better than me to come up, I got a whole list of people who are chomping at the bit. Excellent. Need some more Missoula yeah, you know what? Communities. Missoula is a really cool town. Montana is a beautiful state. Like, I'm not shitting on Montana at all. I'm not shitting on Missoula or anything like that. Actually, um, I got my clip pierced in Montana because they wouldn't do it in Butte. So, hey, Montana, <laughs> Painless Steel. Um, shout out to that place. Is it still there? Painless Steel. Know. That's another great name. Yeah, Painless Steel. I feel like that's how you pick businesses. They just have, if they have a great name. Sometimes it just has a little ring to it. Yeah, Painless Steel. Ah, another pun. Here we uh, I yeah. got my clip pierced at Claire's, so I don't know. <laughs> yeah, well... Anyways, but yeah, it's like so all my all my all my jokes about my piercings that I tell on stage, yeah, that's that where I got it done in Missoula. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you very much for having us. I know it's probably not as controversial as the last couple that you might have had, but uh, I please have me back. And this was very fun. This was very fun. I know yeah. we had some technical difficulties, but again, I'm sucking the electricity out of the room. But. That's it. Yeah, about to lose power. It's it's uh yeah, this is I think this is the first of many podcasts we'll probably be doing at some point. We'll have you back anytime you got someone in town or you got some shit you want to get off your chest, let me know and we're gonna, oh, yeah. we're gonna make okay. that happen. Well I have to get a lot of shit off my chest a lot of the time. So. Beautiful. And I work right up the street, so Perfect. and if anybody needs to get their hair done, please let me know. I've been doing hair for twenty five years and I'm really fucking good. I'm going to do Dave's hair so you guys can see and be like, damn, that hair looks good. And I'm be like, yeah, so Angie Crumb did it. And I have to pee really, really bad. All right, so, so we're going to go ahead and with that. Uh, <laughs> Angie Crumb and Crumb Shots, uh, Blake Powell at, uh, uh, what, is your, what is your thing? Yeah, yeah, follow my TikTok. My Instagram sucks. His Instagram really does suck. <laughs> the, the Girth Brooks. That's the Girth Brooks. The underscore Girth underscore the, Brooks. Is it really? Yeah. It's so oh funny. Oh, my God. You got a way bigger following on TikTok. So. All right, cool. And I am... Uh, you should tell Tom Bomb that. <laughs> and I, I am uh, David Hollywood Hewlett, and there is my information right there. Hit me up if you want to do a podcast or you like this one, et cetera, blah, 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 and come to the Ghost Pepper Open mic again, one more time at Ocha Thai restaurant tonight. At, sign ups at ten. Mike at eleven. You might eat a pepper. It's a lot of fun. If not, you're gonna watch someone do it. Angie, you're allowed to go pee. We are done. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> <sighs>